I hope. Oh, okay. I'll just start the recording. If that's all right. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's no problems. Uh, how do I go? For, how do I go forward on my? So you 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 can just at the left hand bottom corner of your screen. You can use the mouse oh. or you can use the keyboard. Okay. All right. So. Um, Hi, yes. my name's Rob Thomas. Yes. I'm a, a, a diagnostic and interventional radiologist, but largely based out of St Mary's and uh, Hammersmith as well, occasionally. But um, I've been uh, trying to set up an acute PE service uh, at this trust for um, a couple of years now. Uh, in fact, 4th of April 2016 was my first attempt, and it's taken a little while to get here. This is largely motivated by, uh, initially it was motivated by one of our cardiology colleagues who had a large PE, and we didn't quite know what to do with it. Um, and then... And we actually had one of our colleagues um, sadly uh, pass and die um, from a large PE, one of our hepatology colleagues. So there was sort of this, 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 this challenged us to really sort out what we were doing and maybe try and uh, help this, uh, this, this small niche of patients. So I, I, I put this talk together uh, a little while back. Um, uh, I was only just realised now this is a grand round. So I, uh, uh, I, ho I hope this is good enough for you all. But uh, this is this is this is my take on it. And then who's nicely smiling on camera here, is uh, is uh, it, it will, will take over for the for the bits and bobs. But anyway, let me let me tell you let me tell you a bit about my story. So um, uh, we all know that deep vein thrombosis. Uh, we are seeing more and more of it. Uh, has lots of comorbidities, and uh, because uh, obviously aging population, uh, we're we're naturally as a westernized nation getting slightly larger. And we're changing um, uh, population densities of ethnicity, but also increasing cancer risks. We're seeing more and more DVTs. Um, and although we know DVT carries a, a significant mortality, for us, actually, the bigger problem is morbidity. Um, post thrombotic syndrome is a, is a disaster, really, and uh, is defined as some very, very unusual and non-specific symptoms that can be very, 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 very debilitating and is a really difficult thing for patients to live with. And part of that process, obviously, is, the, is, uh, is, is venous thrombolysis and, and pulmonary embolisms. And we know that the two are intimately linked. So about 50% of all patients with PEs have uh, DVTs. And anyone who, um, so about 80% of patients with PEs have DVTs. And about, patient, about half the patients with a proximal DVT will go on to have a, a PE. So um, the, 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 the two are very closely linked. And we're doing things regularly to try and um, clear large volume iliofemoral deep vein thrombosis. And we're doing it to... Um, basically try and break down the, uh, uh, the, 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 the clot propagation. Um, and there's lots of different um, uh, tools to do this on, on, on the market. And we, we have most of these between Hammersmith, Charing Cross and, and Mary's. Um, but essentially, you want to augment the effect of lysis by reducing the large clot burden in the iliofemoral uh, deep venous system. But you want to kind of do that and still maintain and preserve uh, the valvular anatomy um, so that there is a uh, uh, reduced risk of uh, post thrombotic syndrome but not increased risk of valvular reflux. Um, and if we can do all of this and augment it and increase the uh, speed of, uh, of, uh, of clearance, we can actually reduce inpatient stay, uh, reduce patient admission to HDU and ITU, and uh, actually the patient can have a, a slightly less rocky course through Imperial. Um, Irrelevant of being out of Europe now, I'm afraid the uh, we, we we it still stands that there's a, a large amount of uh, of, of, of PE seen uh, across across the world. But there, there's a number there: 300,000 people on average have a PE in the in the EU every year, um, and it accounts for a huge amount of mortality within hospitals, up to 15% in 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 one of the references there. And in the states, uh, more people it says more people die from PE than highway fatalities, breast cancer, and AIDS combined. So. It's, it's a pretty crazy stat, but um, this is what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to, we're trying to select those patients who have a, a life-threatening PE and uh, trying to help them and steer them away from circulatory collapse. So just to add a bit of clinical context to this, uh, about three, four years ago, we had a young chap who got off a plane. Um, he was, it was a long-haul flight, and he presented to St Mary's in the acute setting and was essentially pre-syncopal. Um, he was sweaty, tachycardic. He was maintaining a blood pressure, but he had uh, reduced oxygen. He had, he had increasing oxygen requirements with a low PO2. I didn't select this case because it's the kind of case that makes us all sit up and pay attention. This case is exactly what we see all the time in this group of patients. This is a very typical case, a young patient who has a DVT uh, and a PE for whatever reason, and they present with um, uh, clinical parameters that are, are quite scary, but because they have youth on their side, they're resilient. Um, and uh, this is a very, very typical case. Um, 
so historically we used to break down PEs into uh, minor, massive, and submassive. You know, the minor PEs we know how to how to deal with those. You guys are dealing with that all the time. The massive ones we know how to deal with those. They get systemic thrombolysis because they're hypotensive. But it's a submassive group which accounts for about forty percent of the PE population that we just 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 don't quite know where to act do we do we go down the systemic thrombolysis route do we go down the anticoagulation route are there alternatives and um over the couple over the last few years different uh different um clinical directors have, have, have tried to uh stratify these patients and um break them down and they're using different um severity scores so this is the PESI score that we're all used to there's a well score of course um, and you can try and risk stratify these patients group, patient groups into different, in, 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 into different ways and then maybe change their clinical course or, in, or intervene earlier. So um, if you use the ESC guidelines, um, they uh, manage to actually break down the intermediate risk patients into intermediate high risk and intermediate low risk. And this is largely based on PESI testing um, and the presence or not of uh, right ventricular dysfunction on, um, on echocardiogram. So if we do that, um, we uh, then um, we then break down uh, the intermediate high risk, uh, sorry, the intermediate risk into intermediate high and intermediate low risk. And, you know, it does look as though you just sort of divide the two in half, but there is a little bit of science behind it. But essentially, you have, you have a higher mortality um, of that 40%. Uh, patient group uh, in the first three months if you're doing an intermediate high risk PE. So what is, you know, we're a bit crazy. I talk to medics about, uh, about the, 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 the role of PE in the, in, in, in the catastrophic circulatory collapse, but we know that this thing is a, is, a, is, a, is a vicious cycle and we need to break it somehow. So along all these steps, whether it be redistribution, pulmonary artery pressure changes, RV ischemia, impaired RV and LV filling, we have to stop this somehow to prevent circulatory collapse. And it's where we intervene to try and break this cycle. Um, we know now that right ventricular dysfunction is a positive predictive marker for mortality. There's a, a, a retrospective study of about two and a half thousand patients, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, that showed that if you have uh, RV dysfunction, um, you are more likely to die or have some form of, you know, so you're, you're more likely to die within the first two to, th two to three months two weeks of three months compared to those patients who do not have RV impairment. And that is a really, really big and powerful statement to make. And then um, uh, Chest went and said, well, hold on, let's try and, let's try and put a number on that. So, they, so looking at about, about 1,500 patients retrospectively, they said, well, if you have an echocardiogram where the RV-LV ratio is greater than 0.9, that as a numerical independent predictive marker of mortality, can tell you wh where those patients are going to lie in uh, their treatment course. So if you have an RVLV ratio of greater than 0.9, your chance of dying in the first three months is 6.6%, which is markedly higher than if you didn't have uh, the, the same RVLV ratio. And it's it's it, it's not linear, but it's it's it, it makes sense that the, the, the greater the ratio, the more chance you have of, uh, of mortality. So if you have an RVLV ratio greater than 1.5, uh, your chance, uh, you have a 17% chance of death in the first three months. So current standards of care, anticoagulation. That's basically what everyone gets, systemic anticoagulation. We know that in those patients who either present as a massive or move into the massive territory, there is the risk, there is the option of systemic thrombolysis. And we're currently following the guidelines where they basically give you 150 milligrams IV and pumps around the body and it dislodges some of the clot. If you haven't got much pump, you can't get much thrombolysis there. And that's the problem we're having. So at the extreme of that, you've got surgical thrombectomy, which I don't think we wish upon anyone, even our worst enemies, because it is a terrible thing to go through. And it has, I think, almost 100% recurrence rate of central clot. So it's a really, it's, we really try to avoid that at all costs. At this point, I want to bring in another New England Journal paper from 2014. It's called the PYTHO study. Um, and this was a relatively well-powered randomized multi-center trial involving about a thousand patients. Um, and it, it split the patients into two arms. One, one group of patients who had systemic thrombolysis and those patients who didn't. And then they followed the patients up over seven days. And the outcome is this, essentially all of those patients, the all-cause mortality was the same. 
However, there's a st st statistically significant chance of you having circulatory collapse if you're in a placebo arm than if you're in a tenecteplase arm. And similarly, a lot of those patients crossed over from the placebo arm back into the systemic thrombolysis arm. So there is a benefit from having systemic thrombolysis in, in uh, intermediate high-risk PE patients, which is the patient group we're talking about. The problem is, is this, that benefit is attenuated by the fact that by having systemic thrombolysis, you are much, much more at risk of having a minor or a major bleed. And in fact, you're a two to 3% higher risk of having a hemorrhagic stroke um, uh, in, 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 in that patient, in those patients who have systemic thrombolysis. So the benefit is attenuated. We don't see the benefit that we recognize in, in, in reducing the mortality or the circulatory collapse. So what can we do? Well, you know, interventional radiology is, 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 is one of many minimum invasive procedures that are trying to change the way we, we do things on a much smaller platform. Um, and we have access to two, uh, two devices that are recognized for the treatment of um, pulmonary embolism. One is called an angiojet device, which is a rheolytic uh, thrombolytic catheter where you create a vortex and, and a venturi effect around the clot. And you basically break it down and suck it in at the same time. We have angiojet uh, at all three sites. And the other one is ECOS, which is uh, an ultrasound cystic thrombolysis and this is what we're using mostly now for our deep vein thrombosis and also our PE and also our intra-arterial um, uh, uh, thrombolysis as well and we've we, you know we used a lot of this anyway but then COVID came along and now we're using even more of it so um, ECOS is a really interesting bit of technology basically it infuses thrombolysis at a rate that is governed by the by the clinical team um, along the catheter there are multifocal ultrasound devices and it essentially shakes the clot and by shaking the clot you increase the, di the diameter between the fiber and strands and the acoustic nature of the ultrasound drives the thrombolysis that's, that's then infused into the local regional environment deep into the clot and you get much faster breakdown pardon me much faster breakdown of clot so you can clear a clot quicker clear clot quicker i should put, yeah, put that on a t-shirt clear clot quicker um, but essentially, that's what we try to do. Um, and we certainly see that in our DVT platform, which we've been doing for many, many years now. And as a result of that, we've reduced our inpatient stay, our time on HDU, and the cost of treating these patients from about £15,000 a patient to about five. So this technology works. And um, uh, obviously, just putting it in a bigger, uh, higher flow of vessel in the lungs, who's to say that you'll get the same benefit? But I just want to just... Just, just take you through that journey and show you the data we have to date. So it's used quite a lot in many different trials. I wrote this, I wrote, I, I wrote this talk a few years back, but this was the data we had uh, at that time. But the, the, largest, um, the largest trial is the Ultima trial, where um, they say that if you use um, ECOS uh, and heparin, as opposed to just heparin, um, you are more likely to see uh, a resolution of right ventricular strain in the first 24 hours of up to 30%. So let's take a step back. So if you're saying that RV, the size of an RV is an independent predictor of mortality, and we can reduce that by 30% in the first 24 hours, I suppose we are therefore inferring that overall mortality in the long term is reduced. I don't have any data on that, but that's what I'm trying to tell you. And that benefit initially seen in 24 hours is actually maintained to three months. And Looking at, the, looking at the same patient cohort who had heparin alone, you don't see anywhere near the same kind of, um, of benefit. Now, I appreciate that three months as natural remodeling of the right ventricle, which is the natural state of play, but, you, but by just giving heparin alone, you're sort, of rolling the, you're sort of rolling the dice a bit. I mean, do you say, well, we'll, we'll allow it to naturally, naturally remodel, but actually, are we going to see a large, a large proportion of those patients have a circulatory collapse during that time? So... There, there, there looks to be there's a benefit from using an ECOS during that. So if we maintain that benefit uh, in mind, then let's compare the, the two largest studies using ECOS and using systemic thrombolysis, where we know that both of them have a benefit. And the, the, the great thing about this is that there was not a single major hemorrhage um, complication in the trials, the yellow trials here, that uses uh, accelerated thrombolysis catheters in the treatment of PE. So three to five risk of having an intracerebral hemorrhage in a systemic thrombolysis group with a benefit inferred from using thrombolysis and a 0% chance or as close to 0% chance as possible as having an intracerebral hemorrhage in those patients where uh, you use uh, catheter-related thrombolysis. So 
what happens? Patient comes. So uh, I, I think. Well, I'll take you through the, the 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 plan of action in a minute. But in the case of Mr. Ello, this is what happened. He came in through the front doors of St. Mary's. His CT. He was obviously screened and reviewed by the by the by the uh, admitting clinical team. He was sent for a CTPA. Large volume CTPA was found with a large RVLB ratio. Um, he was then referred. That was then highlighted to us uh, as the uh, reporting interventional radiology team on call. And then we activated uh, a PERT team, which at that time was basically just Luke Howard, but has since been formalized um, and is now a very uh, robust uh, uh, and, and um, uh, efficient team that is on call. Uh, and Gulam will talk to you about that. Uh, they then come to the interventional radiology suite. We puncture their right common femoral vein. Uh, it's a six French catheter. And, and we cross the right side of the heart and we bury um, the catheters into the right lower lobes for natural reasons to do the ventilation perfusion. And we put the ethicos catheter in. And all those little black dots you can see there are the ultrasound machines that then shape the clots and uh, it infuses thrombolysis at the same time. So after, 20, after 12 hours of infusion, Mr. Ello's RVLV ratio reduced to less than 0.9. He, during that whole time, was in level two care. He felt much better and his pulse dropped from 125 to 78 and his blood pressure systolic rose from 105 to 147. And when I went to remove the catheter from him at 12 hours, he, had, he was on nasal cannulae uh, with 97% uh, saturating on finger probe. In that entire 12 hour time, he took a total volume of 24 milligrams of TPA as opposed to 150 milligrams that you give for a systemic thrombolysis dose. So, I, I, I have not handpicked this patient to say this is our one success. This is what we see all the time. Um, and um, this gentleman was actually a foreign national and we never followed him up, sadly. He went back to Denmark. But um, uh, this is the kind of benefits we're seeing in the, in the immediate post-procedural period. So this is what we're proposing. Um, anyone who has a PE, um, I don't know, I don't know, uh, uh, I, I, I don't want to put words in Gulen's mouth, but anyone who has a PE can now access the PE uh, response team. For those patients who have massive PE, which is essentially hypotension, unstable, they, they get fast track and go straight to systemic thrombolysis. For those patients with a non-massive PE, we start to risk stratify them, and we look at the RVLV ratio in relation to biochemical markers of, um, of uh, cardiac dysfunction, so troponin, D-dimer, and BMP. If the pulmonary hypertension team, in addition with the clinical team, feel that there is a benefit um, based on uh, the, the data that we have to date and the clinical parameters of the patient, then they can then activate the catheter the thrombolysis pathway. And that is what we're proposing to treat that small niche of uh, clinical patients who will benefit from this, um, from this treatment. But essentially what I'm trying to propose to you today is that we are saying that there's a small subgroup of PEs where we would like to be involved with uh, a, more, a more proactive treatment. It's a safe uh, and well-practiced uh, treatment for catheter thrombolysis. Um, it could affect up to about 40% of your PE population. Um, and it's built around uh, RVLV ratios of 0.9 with increased biochemical markers of right ventricular dysfunction. And, um, we hope to do this with a minimal, if not zero, risk of major, uh, in, uh, major bleeding and, um, and in the long term, hopefully help them uh, recover some form of cardiac, cardiac function. Um, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Gulam now, or we'll take any questions on that talk, but um, thank you for letting me uh, to, to, to talk and stutter my way through that. I appreciate it. That was really fantastic. Thank you very much. Before we just switch over, are there any questions for Rob? anybody who wants to unmute because I've got one which is just just so you go to the to the groin through the IVC through the tricuspid and pulmonary valve is that right you thread it all the way through yeah absolutely yeah so so as you would do for an IVC filter you know you'd, you'd puncture the groin or the neck for example, but in this case you puncture the puncture the groin and you know the nat the, the RV is massive at this point yeah. So actually, any any catheter uh, we, we've got a designated catheter, but any catheter will sort of flip into the uh, into the pulmonary outflow tract quite easily, um, and then it's just a matter of um, using the, the the right hydrophilic wires. So yeah, from the groin through the IVC across into the right atrium, across the right uh, right ventricle into the pulmonary outflow tract, and then we navigate the uh, wires down into the lower lobe arteries, uh, lower lobe pulmonary arteries bilaterally. 
Okay, and the dose are using is much lower. I mean, would you not think about using it for the massive ones as well? So we could, but they've got circulatory collapse at that point, essentially. Yeah. They, they've got a systolic of less than 100. So we have, I have actually used it in patients who, despite our best efforts, have moved into the massive picture. Um, and part of our SOP, which I'm sure we can share with you, does involve a, that small patient cohort where clot propagation happens literally in front of our eyes. And one of our colleagues, um, I forget now, I think it was, Bill, actually, I think it was Bill Oldfield before he left. He said, I've got a bad feeling about this patient. And within half an hour, this patient had done exactly what he thought was going to happen. So um, yes, we can use it in massives. The problem is you need a, a bit of time to get a room together. You need some anesthetic uh, awareness because of reperfusion injuries. Um, you just need a bit of time, as with any minimum invasive procedure for this to happen. Um, and that's why it's kind of limited to the submassive group. OK, there's lots of questions coming in. Michael fans with his hand up. So, Mike. Hi, thanks very much. Yeah, I, I agree, Chris. It's very impressive. Um, I wondered if there was any uh, room for adjustment as you go along, you know, or, or prolongation uh, of the um, infusion, depending on progress. I mean, do you titrate what you're doing at all? Uh, hi. Uh, yeah. No, so the answer to that question is essentially we don't. In fact, over time we've 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 changed the protocol to reduce um, to reduce both the thrombolysis, thrombolysis dose and time. In fact, some centres are now only doing this for six hours, and some centres are actually doing this without the patient even going to uh, uh, HDU care at all. We built this SOP around the current largest body of data, um, and as more data comes back comes out, we'll obviously change the SOP. But as I said, you know, the biggest burden to us here is going to be the secondary care um, aspect of it. Sorry, this, this level two care is the is, is, our, is the biggest burden here. But as I said, some, some teams around the country are bringing the patients down and they're sitting in recovery for six hours, uh, seeing the benefit then and there, and then, um, and then uh, send them back to a normal ward. Now, we're not trying to clear the clot. That would be crazy. We're not trying to clear all the clot. We're just trying to make sure there's an outflow from the heart into the lungs. And then over time, the benefits of anticoagulation can be realised. But until you've, until you've restarted that circulatory process, you're not all you're going to get is clot propagation and probably extension of the clot. Thank you. There's some technical questions. I'm going to be very quick now because I want to move on to the next talk. But next question, do you use the same sheath for catheter? Very technical. We it, it, well, so, so if it's one lung, one sheath. Two, lung, two lungs, two sheaths. Okay. And then David James wants to know, is the, do you measure the RVLV by echo? So we... Um, it, it, yeah. it depends. So we, we don't have the luxury of uh, cardiology support or St Mary's, where this has been running for about four or five years. Um, but, and the SOP is built around the fact that it's a scarce resource. So we are measuring RVLV ratio on a planned and um, codified way of measuring uh, it on CTPA. Um, and then we're following the patients up with echo um, in the sort of cold light of day. But we're, we're making a decision on a CTPA platform. Um, uh, yeah, that's basically it. Okay, there's something from Pranav about, I think it's a bit political about uh, cardiology SPRs <laughs> doing that. And, um, and then Doris has answered my question. Thank you, Doris. Oh, so Doris asks, can we make this happen on all three sites, please, not only St. Mary's? No, this is the, so absolutely. This is the this is the, this is this is the reason we're putting so much energy into it. This is not about this is a not a Mary centric uh, thing. So historically, this was started as a trial at St. Mary's, and quite rightly so. We cannot say to our patient cohort that you get a different type of care in one hospital compared to another. So as we took this forward as part of the SOP, the one thing that we said to the trust was this: we have to be able to ensure that there is um, equality for all patients across all three sites. So you are currently receiving this talk because we are in the process of rolling this out at Charing Cross. It's been running at Mary's for five years. It was officially SOP'd uh, the year before last. And then this crazy thing, I don't know if you heard it here, called COVID, and it kind of stopped us in our tracks. So although we were meant to roll this out in March last year, we couldn't because level two and level three care was completely swamped. So as we're starting to ease that off now, we're now having the, 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 the nurses in ITU and everyone saying, actually, we now have the bandwidth to support this. So this is now the process. So Mary's is up and running. It's been live for many years. Charing Cross is currently being trained up and is hopefully going live when we met that target. And then there's a plan to roll it out into Hammersmith and have a live service there as well. So by the, by the end of, well, hopefully the next three to six months, you will have this available on all three sites, uh, governed by a central PERT team running through Gulam and, 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 his, um, and his colleagues. So one last point from Eamon, and then we'll move on to Gulam's talk. Eamon? 
You just to unmute though. Sorry for that. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask if there is if there was any. So we know that there is many. Um, there have been many clinical trials ha comparing um, ECOS and directed fr thrombolysis uh, to um, um, heparin or systemic anticoagulation. But it, were there any uh, clinical trials that have compared um, ECOS to systemic thrombolysis in massive PEs? In terms of RV recovery, hemodynamics, mortality, I'm going to hand that one over to Gulam. Um, he's got a much, he's got a much better depth of knowledge on the uh, academic basis for this platform. Um, so I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to sneak off on that one, but um, I'll hand you over to him for that. Thank you, Rob. So Gulam, do you want to share your slides? I'll share my slide. Yeah, that was, I mean, that was a great talk. Me. You'll answer that question while doing your talk. I'll answer that question by doing the talk. I mean, Rob's given an absolutely great talk, and I've got little to add to that now in terms of um my presentation can you see my presentation yes, on screen yes. yes we can perfect thank you okay um so rather than running through the whole talk i'm going to take it down to some of the evidence base behind uh systemic lysis and catheter directed lysis in this cohort of patients and allow us to build a better understanding of where the perk team comes into play and exactly what we're trying to achieve so uh, we all know, as Rob said, that we're trying to prevent obstructive shock and failure of the right ventricle in the acute setting to ensure that the patient doesn't die. Now, we know that a mean pulmonary artery pressure of above 40, i.e. that degree of afterload imparted onto the right ventricle in the acute setting is enough to cause death. So where do we go? We've got two groups of patients that we're considering here. We've got the very high risk patients who are actually quite easy to deal with. They've got circulatory collapse, they need systemic lysis. There's no, there's no two ways about it. Then we've got the intermediate to high risk cohort, i.e. if we discount PESI slightly, I get quite reticent in regards to PESI because a lot of the parameters that PESI looks at are based on age and comorbidity. So it misses the young group of patients who may well just drop dead very, very quickly. But if we think about trying to select out a subgroup of patients from the intermediate to high risk cohort, i.e. significant thrombotic burden with an enlarged RV and high cardiac biomarkers, we need to then look to some studies that have been done in the past. So the PITHO study that Rob touched upon is a New England Journal paper, and I'm, I'm not one to criticize New England Journal papers, and I'll never publish them myself. However, they looked at an endpoint, which was death and hemodynamic decompensation in a thousand patients, 500 of which received systemic lysis for intermediate to high risk PD, and 500 of which received anticoagulation alone. What they said was they met their primary endpoint, which was death and hemodynamic compensation, okay, with a significant difference of 2.6% versus 5.6% across those two groups. If you then select out and you look at death over the seven day period, knowing that you can lyse an intermediate to high risk PE later on in the process, i.e. if they decompensate in 24 to 48 hours, what they actually did was they lysed 28 patients in the anticoagulation group alone. And the between group death rate at seven days was no difference. So effectively what this study has done has shown that if you use lytic reperfusion therapies in 500 patients with an intermediate to high risk PE, you actually only need to lyse 28 of those patients to end up with the same outcome in seven days. And what they also demonstrated was an unacceptably high risk of extra and intracranial bleeding, okay? So effectively, you've got time to wait in these patients to make a decision. And that's where the PERT team comes in. I know we get a lot of calls now with intermediate to high-risk PEs and we get presented beautiful cases such that Rob's displayed. And when we say anticoagulate, I think sometimes there's a little bit of a recoil to think, well, no, we've got to do something here. Now, Eamon's point about the difference, you know, between CDL and systemic lysis, there have been no directly comparative trials, okay? But what we do know is that CDL is much safer in terms of bleeding risk than systemic lysis. So when you're hedging your bets slightly in intermediate to high risk group, you will ultimately go for catheter-directed lysis. 
just as an aside from um, acute mortality at 30 days, if you look at a paper that was written by uh, you know, a very eminent PH and formerly em embolism physician on the continent, you'll see that he took these patients from the PETHO study and he followed them up to three years because one of the things that we often get asked is, is there a difference in the rate of chronic thrombomolic pulmonary hypertension if you lyse these patients acutely? And you'll see from the next slide or two, and I'll be very quick, that there is a bit of dubiosity in this regard, but the simple answer is no. You do not improve outcomes in terms of CTEF if you lyse someone acutely. So therefore, what we're saying really is that, you know, we've got time to wait to think about what to do in intermediate to high risk group. We're not really gonna change mortality at 30 days, and we're not gonna change outcomes in terms of CTEF at 30 years. So you start realizing it's, it's quite a niche population. This trial here, which looked at low dose lysis and followed up outcomes in terms of development of pulmonary hypertension, is a good trial in that it shows that half dose systemic lysis, i.e. 50 milligrams as opposed to 100, is akin to that of catheter directed lysis in terms of bleeding risk. So if you give 50 or the 24 of catheter directed lysis, you've got a lower bleeding risk than if you give full dose lysis. The outcomes in terms of pulmonary hypertension are extremely dubious given that they work off a systolic pulmonary artery pressure at echocardiogram. And when you look at the number of patients they said had CTEF, it becomes almost unrecognizable because the, the risk of CTEF following acute P is somewhere around about 4%. They're getting rates of you know, 16 to 27% across their group. So this paper doesn't add much in terms of should we be lysing to prevent CTEF. If we're thinking about lysing, know as well that age is the most important parameter in terms of predicting bleeding risk. And if you're age greater than 65, your risk of intracerebral hemorrhage and major hemorrhage when using systemic lysis is much higher than if you're less than 65. So there comes an argument, therefore, that if you've got a young individual, okay, who's intermediate to high risk, and we want to wait to lyse them, if you need to rush in with systemic lysis, you're not imparting any extra risk. So as we go through this process, we start realizing that actually, you know, this is a much more niche area, okay? But what we're trying to do with the PERT team is bring together, you know, relevant experts to, 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 to be on hand really for acute medicine across the trust to try and select out patients that will die if they don't get systemic reperfusion or catheter directed lysis and they're in that intermediate to high risk group. So just as a little marker, things to be aware of are a respiratory rate of greater than 20, a high heart rate, a blood pressure of less than 110, a CO2 of less than four, and a lactate of greater than two. Okay, they're things that we should be thinking about. And also, if you have scanned the legs, significant proximal DVT burden. Um, if you're faced with any of these patients, um, you know, Monday to Sunday, we do have, uh, a rotor running now, which is held centrally by switchboard. Um, it's run by the four of us who are the pulmonary hypertension physicians at Hammersmith Hospital. We effectively do a one in four for pH, which is a 24 seven cover that we offer. In terms of PERT, we're on hand 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. seven days a week. Um, if you do need extra help out of hours, and we wouldn't advocate undertaking catheter directed lysis out of hours. If you've got a situation out of hours where you think I'm not 100% certain what to do, I don't feel comfortable sitting on this patient with anticoagulation overnight, knowing that that effectively is the right thing to do for the intermediate to high risk group, then you can always come through to the pulmonary hypertension consultant on call and, and, and we'd be more than happy to help you. Um, so really, I mean, that's the role of PERT. Rob's given an excellent talk. There's very little for me to say, but I do welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. That was very clear. Do you want to just put that pathway back? Because this has a, I mean, it's not that uncommon. And um, we just need to make sure that everybody knows that we can contact somebody uh, if they have yeah. any quite big pulmonary emboli. Yes. Um, and that's really, so thank you for doing this. It's really important that everyone knows. Uh, so, and then the other thing, so you're, you're on a continuous rotor. So you're doing a lot of, <laughs> a lot of clocked hours, um, which means that some, one of you's got to be able to come in at any time in the day. So we don't actually have to come in. So we don't do the procedure. Rob does the procedure, unfortunately. 
And we're only he's on a one in one. He's on a one in one. He's on well, no, no. I mean, there's various interventionists across the trust that are doing it. Right. You're champion at Charing Cross once it's up and running. Um, so I know Elik has got a hand up as well, who's one of our other IR colleagues at um, at St Mary's. Uh, yeah, do you want to ask a question? I know, thank you. I just wanted to say that I think Rob's done a really, really brilliant job with kind of getting this service going, and I'm so excited that we're kind of ready to roll it out. It is a, a, a offered across the three sites, and all interventional radiologists do it. And if there's any risk or any kind of uncertainty, we're all kind of, we all have sort of WhatsApp chat groups and call a friend set up. So I think all of us are ready. So hopefully Rob won't be in a one in one, um, but I, I'm sure he'll want to be there for every single one because he just loves. PE clots, but it, it is a service that uh, it, it's a comprehensive service across the three sites. Amazing, thank you. Any other questions or thoughts? And Elika, just a caveat: we're we're not up and running at Hammersmith yet. Okay. And that will take no, a bit no, no, more time. No, no, no. So basically, we we are the, what the skill set is there. The uh, and the team are ready to go. It's just about the setup clinically. But from a uh, skill set and service perspective, the IR guys are all on board and ready to go. Is what I was not right, what I meant. Sorry. Thank you. And George asked, is there an age cutoff? There's no, there's no age cutoff. Okay. Um, so, so we just make sure that all A and E's have got uh, the number to ring or how to get hold of the. You, you, take, you just go to switchboard basically. So through right? switchboard, you just ask for the pulmonary embolism response consultant on call, and they'll put you straight through. Great. And there's a question from Ernie Wong. Oh, hi, Gulam. Thanks for having me talk. Hi. Um, so I just want to clarify, because uh, as the respiratory consultant on call, we often get asked these things as well. But yes. I think, I, would you be happy for us to give the general advice? And obviously, if it's a question about PERT, um, then we will direct those queries to you. Absolutely. Yeah, no problem at all. I think if, if, if you want to call us in, then you can either call us directly or we'd be happy to speak to anyone involved in the care of the patient. Okay, cool, yeah. question from uh, Doris about using a swan gand and giving some low dose anticoagulation through that. Is there any evidence using low dose hemolysis through the standard swan gands that ITU use all the time? Doris, that's, that's a very interesting question because effectively, you know, that's catheter directed lysis, but in a setting where you can't move somebody down to the IR suite and in whom you don't want to give systemic lysis in. So we have had discussions about similar patients, you know, those that may have associated large right atrial thrombi, for example, um, who are very at risk of decompensation and RVOT obstruction, or who have sat on IT and you just can't move them. And, and, and I'm not I'm not adverse to doing that in a niche group of patients if necessary. Oh, this is not standard, Doris is telling me now. Okay. Doris, do you want to say anything? Just unmute and just... Uh... Yes, as I said, sadly, we've lost the skill of doing PA catheters because we don't really use them much anymore. But I do wonder whether it might be worth to have catheters back on each side. Like, you know, I know at Charing Cross, we don't even have a catheter on the unit anymore. For these maybe few patients who we can't move anywhere or it's in the middle of the night and who might benefit from having a smaller dose rather than being systemically um, thrombolized. Mm -hmm. It's a good it's a good question isn't it i mean obviously we're going to use the standard full dose aren't we for most people if we're if we're stuck in the night i think so i think there's going to be subgroups but we're going to try and use systemic lysis catheter directed lysis for the ir and then there's going to be these group of patients particularly on icu where you know the rules do change slightly and we're always on hand for those hopefully i mean certainly in the same way that uh, coronary artery work has moved into the coronary artery from systemic I personally feel if I had a pulmonary embolus, I'd like someone to poke in there and get it out rather than give me a dose of something that will make me bleed everywhere. That's the, you know, my human thoughts. To regain that skill after all. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, look, I'm going to put that recording um, in a couple of days onto YouTube and send you all link. But thank you very much indeed. That was uh, very helpful, clear and important. Great. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Next week, we're going to have a gastro, uh, a gastro session, just to let everyone know. Okay, we're, we're active next week as well. <laughs>